Conversations across time. Conversations across cross time. Conversations across time. Conversations across time. Conversations across time. Conversations across cross time. Conversations across time. Conversations across cross time. Conversations across time. Conversations across cross time. Conversations across time. Conversations across time. Conversations across time. Conversations across cross time. Conversations across time. A call, call, call. Conversations a call, call. Conversations a call, call, call. Conversations a 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 call, call. Conversations. This week's episode of Conversation brings back together again Lyndon Baines Johnson, President of the United States. Queen Esther of Persia, and Spartacus. They will continue their vigorous debate about helping the oppressed and how Queen Esther saved the people of Persia, uh, the Jewish people of Persia. Welcome to Conversations Across Time, the television show that allows you, the viewer, to observe imaginary conversations between historical personalities. And um, tonight, uh, we have, and when I say we, my co-host, as always, who's ever present, is uh, former state representative Babette Josephs. Babette, welcome. We are here once again, and we're going to take up this conversation with these very interesting Very people. happy to be part of it. I'm so happy that you're always here. You sort of keep us balanced. Uh, seated next to Babette is Spartacus. Welcome once again, General Spartacus. I'm not a general, but thank you. <laughs> uh, seated next to Spartacus is once again, Queen Esther. Welcome, Queen Esther. Thank you kindly. It's lovely to be here yet again. Thank you. And seated next to Queen Esther is President Lyndon Johnson. Thank you once again for joining us, President Johnson. Please all mine, ma'am. Now, I thought it was interesting, uh, Spartacus, when you corrected me that you are not a general. I think part of what's most exciting and interesting to me about your, your particular history is that uh, you were born in Thrace, and Thrace would be, in today's world, Thrace would be Bulgaria. And um, it's particularly interesting that your background was that you were once a free man, then a soldier, and then a gladiator. Well, I'm sorry, then a soldier, then a slave who was made to be a gladiator. Um, you led 70,000 men. You led a revolt in which you got uh, slaves who were enslaved as gladiators with you to break out of the school where you were held. And um, that became a sizable army when other slaves started to join. And at that time, as we said last week, one in three persons in Rome were slaves. So we can understand how threatening that army must have been. But what is also interesting is the Roman Empire. You took on the Roman Empire. At that time- and did a good job of Almost beating them. And of almost beating them. And, and beat them in several battles, in several decisive battles. Um, your background as a Roman soldier is probably what allowed you to train this group of slaves and former gladiators to actually be a military force, but your specialty was guerrilla warfare. And you almost beat the Roman Empire, and you became such a threat to them that, it, I mean, initially, they thought that it would be easy enough to quell this rebellion. And uh, with 3,000 uh, with, with 3, slaves, former slaves, you defeated the Roman army. Not the entire Roman army, but the army. Because see, Italy, which is where you were enslaved, was considered safe. So the Roman army was busy off conquering new territories. They thought that home was safe. 
that you must understand that we did not beat the Roman Empire, nor did we take on the Roman Empire. The events you speak of are really a necessary consequence of the situation in which we found ourselves. Explain, you see, please. Everywhere in the world, men and women alike, I suppose, at least as much as men, want to be free. And so, that small number of us who took up kitchen knives to conquer the people who were holding us and training us in preparation for a violent, bloody death, we weren't doing anything special, really. We weren't an army. Each man there was fighting for himself more than for anything else. It just happened that because of our condition, each of us fighting for ourselves was by extension fighting for all of the others because the same people who enslaved each of us individually had enslaved us collectively. Is that different from most wars of rebellion? I would think that that's... But it's, it, the difference is, is, is simple. When people think about wars of rebellion, and revolutions, there is usually some higher goal in mind, some fancy words for liberty, for liberation, for... Certainly we did when we broke away from but Britain, the French. We were, we were men. We were men in a, in a slave camp. There was no... Well, let's... Let, I, because what I find, uh, the, something that I think is sort of glossed over with this, gladiator school, you were actually being trained to fight each other for the amusement of wealthy people. To fight each other to the death for the amusement of wealthy people. We found it much less amusing. Of course. One would think so. Yes, of course. Yes, absolutely. And, and, I, and I think when, so when you said we were fighting for our freedom, yes, because not just were you slaves, but in some twisted sense of what would be called entertainment for the elite of the Roman Empire. They were amused by watching the slaves fight each other to the death. That was their form of entertainment. And so I, I get it that, that, yes, your rebellion was decidedly different from fighting for some high uh, ideal. You were fighting to be free. Well, Even freedom is such an abstract idea in the way that you're describing it. We wanted, more than anything else, to not be forced to kill each other. That's, that's, noble. That, that's, that's not, that, but there, that's freedom. This freedom is an abstraction. I understand. It's, 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 no more, it's no more complex than wanting to go home at the end of the day. Right. It's very simple. And so to, to describe it as us taking on the Roman army, it, it's. But that's what happened. I mean, that was the... Well, if they hadn't continued to try to stop us from going right. home, we wouldn't have fought anyone. It's, it's, right, it's but nothing. they had to because they were afraid it was going to spread. Yeah. Well, it was going to spread because Rome had to fall. It's, it's, these are such fancy ways of saying such simple things. We, hadn't, we had no choices. We had no... And they Self felt that they didn't have any choices either. So there you were, fighting an army. Let's, let's say something that, that was interesting. Had you proceeded north, because, I mean, the, uh, your idea was to just get out of Italy. And um, you wanted to cross the Alps. And the idea of the, the, the people from Gaul would return to Gaul to their home, people that were Germans, because this was a diverse band that you led. The people that were from Germany could return to their home place. It, all you wanted to do was for people to return home. 
that's even that's a, an oversimplification. Okay. They, for each of us, we're all we're all driven by our own motivations, and, and I imagine that. Are you referring that, to Crixius now? I imagine that every man who fought by my side had his own idea of what he wanted to do. But so for some, it was home. For some, it was a but farm. That's I true, myself, isn't it? I wanted goats. All all I wanted to do was find a wife or three, several, <laughs> and, 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 and several goats, or, you know, more goats, more wives, either way, as long as there's several but, of them. But, but see, what, what a lot of people don't understand about, your, about that group, about that army, about that force, you were headed north, and one of, one of the men who was a part of your organization, Crixius, was interested in staying in Italy and plundering the Romans. Mm. And well, plunder can be rewarding. Well, yeah, but I think that's one of the things that created the problem because 20,000 people who were, you had an army that, that got to the numbers of 100,000. 20,000 of those left with Crixius because they thought it made more sense to plunder Rome when in fact, as you said, all you wanted were goats, everyone wanted something. But the reality is, had you continued north, history would be different. Also, when you were cornered in the, in the heel of Italy, if the Turks who you had negotiated with to take your troops to Sicily, five miles away, if in fact they had lived up to their end of the bargain, you and your army would have escaped, escaped. to Sicily. So I guess what I think is important about this is what a man will do when they're forced to do it. And in this sense, you were dehumanized by having to fight men that you were in school with, that you were training with, to the death. And that's a different sort of notion than Queen Esther was faced with. Queen Esther was a part of a population that were second class citizens who were also going to be annihilated, but annihilated by someone who ultimately, Haman, who was uh, your husband's assistant, mm -hmm. and who ended up being hanged by your husband for his treachery, but Haman wanted to annihilate the but, Jewish but population. But the meantime, the Jewish population was allowed to uprise. They were supplied with arms to defend themselves. That was what you got out of the king. Mm -hmm. And it was almost the same kind of army, mass situation, mass rebellion that Spartacus was involved in. And then we have Johnson <laughs> who yes, madam. tried to make sure this didn't happen in this country. Well, yes? I truly, excuse me, sir, excuse me, Mr. Spartacus, but I truly appreciate what Mr. Spartacus uh, went through in a sense as a teacher in the Catula uh, High School and the Pearsall High School. I noticed, I could not help but notice the young children in poverty, many of them uh, Mexican, and these were children I was taught to despise as, as of a lesser race. And I, for some reason, I was able to overcome that. Well, you and, had intelligence, I would say. Thank you, madam. And I would say that Intelligence uh, never stopped a man from being morally corrupt. Yes. And so let me, let me just say Real this. Intelligence. As I may say, uh, I, Real uh, intelligence. As I may say, ladies and gentlemen, mm -hmm. I, to notice their despair, to notice the lack of hope they would have, it would drive them either to crime or rebel, revolution and, and totally destroy the country. Now, now you, Pre President Johnson, you know, yes. we have some constraints here. And so I'm going to, we're going to pick this up when we come back from break. We have to take a break. But I, I do want you to talk about that when we come back. Very good, ma'am. So what we do, what Conversations Across Time is, we take actors playing historical characters, and we have Babette and myself, and we ask them questions and we mix the time periods. So we, that's why the title Conversations Across Time. So we may have uh, Frederick Douglass having a, uh, a conversation with Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, this 
brings an interesting twist and it gets you to know both of those personalities. So uh, we're very excited about this and we try to put people together that everyone uh, would be surprised about. So we do Thomas Jefferson and Josephine Baker. Um, I'm thinking uh, we've done Abraham Lincoln, for instance, with uh, Eleanor Roosevelt and Frederick Douglass. We also uh, are doing Woodrow Wilson and a good German. And um, we're going to talk about how World War II came about because the Treaty of Versailles was very instrumental in bringing about the hatred that Germany had and the feeling of regret that they had. And that's why Hitler could come to power. So we talk about history from a standpoint that makes it interesting and we do hope that you enjoy us. It's controversial, it's not a polite conversation, it's just people going at it and discussing ideas and um, we leave you to make your own judgments about what could have happened and also about the events that have happened to allow you to put them in perspective. I hope you join us for Conversations Across Time. It's uh, an idea that has been germinating for a long time and I believe there's something for everyone. It's education and entertainment. Welcome back. Uh, when Right before the break, President Johnson was explaining something about his history and how that led him to accomplish or to put forth the type of legislation that he did. And I'd like you to pick up on that again. You taught, and primarily you were teaching Mexican children. That and this was correct. in East Texas, is that correct? That is correct, madam, at the Sam Houston High School in Cotula and the Pearsall High School in Pearsall, Texas. And my memories of these children, uh, knowing that they, because of their poverty and because of their race, the doors of opportunity, such as college, would be closed to them. As I recall it now, it's, it's a very despairing situation. And one could only imagine what kind of di how it could affect people, their thinking, how they react to their society, to their each other, to themselves. Now, I want to ask a question about yes, that. Yes, ma'am. Because we are, those of us that, that, that study history, as, as, as we all do, but those of us that are really inclined to study history, and your history in particular, um, realize that you were able to accomplish so much. And uh, there, was a, there was a time in which, in fact, many African American leaders weren't sure that you were a friend. That is true, madam. I have been in, in contact with Mr. Roy Wilkins of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, and I have understood that he was not sure whether I was a friend or an enemy or a neutral. I but believe was that colored, okay, was that colored by your need as a political leader to disguise what your agenda was to your fellow politicians? Was that what led you to do that? Uh, could you elaborate on that? Ben? I mean that uh, the African American leaders at the time, and Roy Wilkins in particular, I mean I think there was an interview with Roy Wilkins that happened after you, oh, after you passed the Civil Rights, after you enacted the Civil Rights Act. That's true. And, and, and he mentioned that he did not know, he met you in I think 1956 or 57, and he did not view you as a friend to African Americans. But essentially, you were a friend to minorities in general because of your background in having taught these poor Mexican children. And were you, in fact, in disguise? You were, after all, a Southern Democrat, and I think that, that what they called at that time the Dixiecrats. Yes. So you were, you were a Dixiecrat. And I don't think members of your, of, your, um, of your party understood just how progressive you were. Yes, it, it was even a surprise to me, madam, <laughs> to, uh, to, make that a, to make that leap, as it were, to, uh, s to finally be in a position to deal with the terrible social issues that this country was facing. And I truly believe that we're, if I wasn't able to address those issues of poverty and race, uh, we would have a, to be put bluntly, revolution and I believe that the current situation as we face now that possibility is rearing its head again yes due to uh, yes let's due talk to about political short-sightedness I agree 
I agree. The Republican majority in the House and the minority in the Senate that keeps on proposing filibusters anytime a social program is suggested. Um, not too long ago, uh, the Republicans in the Senate illustrated again that they are interested in protecting billionaires. They did not want to eliminate loopholes. But when there was talk of student loans being loosened up and student debt, people being helped with their student debt, the Republicans said, oh, we don't have enough money to do that. And every single Democrat voted against the filibuster. Three Republicans, two independents, and they still couldn't break it. Now, I, now, now think about that. Think about the revolts that happened with Spartacus, the, yeah. the empowering of the Jews under, with Queen Esther having been able to get certain extractions from her husband. I view what you did and the policies and the programs that you put in place, I view that as somehow, I believe your predecessor and you had had conversations and certainly they were scuttled but in Washington DC, that this country was headed in a very, if we were on a very precipitous path towards some sort of upheaval. And there had been things that had happened. Yes, we do have a history in this country of violent upheaval and armed rebellion, as Your Majesty can attest and Mr. Spartacus can attest. When people, we have come to the realization that when a people are not allowed to advance themselves uh, in terms of education and economic advancement, what have you, they ha and they realize that, it, to use the phrase, the cards are stacked against them. They have no, they feel they have no alternative right. but to revolt. Right. When you have nothing to lose, what you always want to do, I would think, if you were in power, whether you were the president or the king, is to make sure all of your subjects, all of your constituents, have something to lose. That's a, an important point, but the fact is that if, as you drew a parallel or attempted to, if you want to compare each of these situations to the situation in which the president empire, the present empire called the United States, faces, it, it, there's some distinctions that must be made. Okay. One, in this slave revolt, of which I took part, that wasn't a revolution. That was an individual situation that exploded and spread. That's what you call this, a revolution. I, I, the, the re, the, here's the reason it wasn't a revolution. There was no central theme. Not really. There were individuals who were all oppressed. The only reason that the revolt went as far as it did and had as much success as it did was because we were many former soldiers who had also been trained as gladiators and therefore had had enough experience with killing to be desensitized to it and to actually start the violence necessary. In the situation in which Queen Esther found herself, there was no revolution possible there because the people who were oppressed were not militarized. And in the situation that- Few in number, I would think, compared to the rest. Compared, exactly. In the situation which President Johnson diffused by supporting and eventually helping to pass civil rights legislation. And social policies, and social policies. That situation could potentially have turned into a revolution, but it was diffused, it preempted by social policy. The situation the United States find themselves in now, at this point, could not foster a revolution for very simple reasons. One, the United States military has been active, but the society at large is not militarized. Every faction that is armed is pitted against another faction ideologically. Okay. They don't agree. 
Revolutions only happen when people find something to agree about, and, and there just isn't enough yet. Well, here's what's interesting. And when they have nothing to lose. And when they have nothing to lose, but what's interesting is this. The powers to be in this country have managed, so you had a diverse group of people who were oppressed, who decided to do something about it. What happens today in this country is that you have these groups like the Tea Party, like the religious right, which is neither, neither religious or right. You have these people who, have, who foster division amongst the oppressed. So in other words, you've got they do their darndest. They try. Yes. But that's why a revolution is not possible. Because we are so busy. When I say we, I count myself as, 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 as amongst those people who suffer, who suffer at these, as a result of these policies. Mm -hmm. We're so divided. We have this whole notion of people who are against people who have a different lifestyle, different sexual orientations. We are fighting over issues. We're fighting over birth control. I mean, you know what Supreme these people Court. need? Yes. They need more goats. They need more goats. <laughs> <laughs> and wives. And wives. And wives. Uh, Mostly goats. <laughs> but, but I mean, what, what's, what's interesting is you've got these people who are victims of oppression. I mean, when I look, when I look at the Tea Party crowds, when they show a, 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 a rally, a Tea Party rally, and I see senior citizens who I know damn well are collecting Social Security. And, and they're getting Medicare. And they're getting Medicare. Some of the things that President Johnson put into place, part of that social network, when I see those kinds of things happening, and here these very people are out there, and they are against the immigrants. They're against the gays. They're against anybody that's not them. They're against the blacks. They're against brown people, they're against yellow people, anybody that, that, that is not their notion of what this country is. So here they are being a party to something that is against their own interests. That is true, madam. I have seen this uh, several times that I have been informed many times about rallies of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, economically, they are no uh, different uh, from black people. Except but uh, the false notion of superiority due yes. to their skin color has been ingrained in them uh, for generations and uh, certain political factions like the Republican Party uh, have uh, played on that. And dividing and conquering is, if you'll forgive the cliche, the oldest trick in the book and instead of uh, tr attempting to reconcile the white working class people with the black people, uh, the Republican Party has used race to uh, separate uh, white people uh, but, from black but, people. But, but when people come out and vote in numbers, that doesn't happen. And that, and that, and we will, we will take this topic up after we come, when we come back. That is such an important thing. That could be the revolution. Not a revolution with weapons, but that could be the revolution. People need to vote. They must vote. We will come back and pick this topic up again. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, I, we have enjoyed this conversation. We've brought up more questions, and we need to at least, I, wa I want to ask if I can impose upon you to come back again and let us take up this. Our pleasure. Our this pleasure. Is an honor. Okay, thank you so much. This has been Conversations Across Time. Please tune in next week when we again talk to this very interesting pile. Thank you so much. Conversations across time. Conversations across cross time. Conversations across time. Conversations across time. Conversations across time. Conversations across cross time. Conversations across time. Conversations across cross time. Conversations across time. Conversations across cross time. Conversations across time. Conversations across